The city of Milan is one of the largest cities in Italy. Nestled away in the north of the country, Milan is served by two primary airports which bear the city's name, the larger Malpensa Airport and the smaller airport located closer to the city itself, Lenate. On October 8, 2001, this airport would become the scene of a devastating accident which claimed the lives of 118 people. This video is about that accident. It's a tale of how two planes collided on the runway at this airport. It involves many aspects like many disasters, from the weather, to the actions of those involved, to the actual airport itself. There is a lot to go over as we discuss the Lanate airport disaster. We begin in the early hours of the morning of October 8, 2001. A small corporate jet was making an approach into the Milan Lanate airport prior to 7 a.m. The plane was a Cessna Citation CJ2. It's a jet which only carries around nine passengers. At 6.54 a.m., the plane made contact with Lanate Airport to request weather information. The plane had originated from Germany and was loaned out from its German owner that would transport an Italian client to Paris later that morning. The Cessna jet did land in Milan as planned that morning, albeit the visibility in the area was very low, down to just a couple hundred of meters. This meant as the pilots landed their plane in Milan, they couldn't even see the end of the runway when it eventually came into view. The plane was taxied onto the general aviation apron on the west side of the airport, known as the West Apron. The runway they landed on was this north-facing runway which, at the time, was labelled as runway 36 right. For reference, its accompanying twin runway 36 left, now closed today, is highlighted here as the much shorter runway. The Nate Airport, in terms of airport layout, has one glaring quirk that stands out that we'll return to later. But as planned, the pilots taxied via this taxiway to their parking position. There it would remain for nearly an hour. To abruptly switch our focus, we now need to look at a completely different plane on the other side of the airport. The main runway separates the two aprons, where the main passenger terminal is located here on the north apron. On that fateful morning, we'd find a McDonnell Douglas MD-87 operated by Scandinavian Airlines. Scandinavian Airlines Flight 686 was expected to depart for Copenhagen, Denmark at 7.35 a.m., but would subsequently be delayed for over half an hour. The MD-87 is a sub-variant of the then-popular McDonnell Douglas MD-80 series of aircraft. It has a shorter fuselage than its sister planes and is more reminiscent in size to the DC-9. Scandinavian Airlines was a large customer and operator of the MD-80 series, having operated over 80 planes of the type all across Europe. On board Flight 686 that morning were 104 passengers and 6 crew members. On the flight deck was 36-year-old Captain Joachim Gustafsson. Having worked for Scandinavian Airlines for over a decade at that point, he had accumulated nearly 6,000 flight hours, though he was still somewhat new to the MD-87, with just around 230 hours logged in the plane. His first officer that morning was also aged 36. Anders Hillander joined the airline in 1997. In that time, he had spent over 2,000 hours in this plane and had over 4,000 total flight hours logged. The pilots of Flight 686, while parked on the North Apron at Lanate Airport that morning, called the control tower at 7.41 a.m. for engine startup. By this point, all of the passengers and cargo were on board. The control tower did give clearance for the pilots to start up the plane's engines, but advised them that their takeoff slot wouldn't be until after 8.16 a.m. Already behind schedule, the plane at this time wasn't heading out to the runway just yet. Several minutes would pass until the time reached 7.54. Flight 686 requested taxi clearance from the airport's control tower. The instructions were received for the MD-87 plane to taxi out to runway 36 right. From their position on the north apron, they would taxi down this main taxiway to reach the end of the runway. Four minutes later, as the plane began their taxi, another plane calls the control tower. It was the Cessna Citation jet that arrived in Milan earlier that morning. 
The plane now had its two pilots and two passengers on board. On the flight deck of that plane were two highly experienced pilots. Captain Horst Konigsmann, age 36, and the 64-year-old first officer Martin Schneider had a combined total flight time exceeding 17,000 flight hours. The two German pilots called the tower at 7.58 for startup clearance. The tower gave the Cessna crew clearance to start the engines and a takeoff slot time of 6.19. Visibility was still poor that morning, ranging between just 50 and 100 meters. The tower could not see the Cessna Citation or the West Apron, or even the end of the runway. Lenate Airport is busy. 24 aircraft had already been assisted by controllers in the hour before the accident. Lenate Airport also lacked ground radar at the time, meaning the controllers in the tower had no way to visually see aircraft positions around the airport themselves. The use of various airport landmarks was used to coordinate a rough estimation of where planes were. For example, that morning, the tower instructed the Scandinavian jet to switch radio frequency to tower control for takeoff once passing the airport fire station. The plane then reported on the tower frequency at 8.01. From this moment on, the two planes, the Scandinavian MD-87 and the Cessna Citation, were on two different radio frequencies. A few more minutes passed and the time was now 8.05. Taxi clearance was now given to the Cessna Citation. The following piece of information is critical. The air traffic controller authorized a route for the plane to take to get to the end of runway 36 right. We must now revisit the airport layout of Lenate Airport. The aerial image of the airport shown thus far in the video has been slightly altered. Showing one this image may lead them to thinking the logical routing for the citation to take to get to the runway would be to follow this taxiway, the way it came into the apron. This was not the instruction given to the plane. You see, there is another taxiway here. Instead, they were supposed to taxi north of their position and follow a taxiway that runs north of the west apron and wraps around the north end of the runway. This taxiway then connects to the north apron where the Scandinavian jet was parked. From there, the citation would largely follow the same routing as that plane did just minutes ago. This taxiway is highly unusual, giving Lenate Airport a unique layout and was labeled at the time as Romeo 5. Here is the exact instruction the Citation pilots received. Delta Victor X-Ray, an abbreviation of the registration of the plane, taxi north via Romeo 5. The existence of Romeo 5 implies the existence of Romeo 1 through 4. So where are these located? 1 through 4 are the entrance and exit points of the main runway on the east side. Romeo 5 was the already discussed northern taxiway, so where did the citation actually taxi? Basically, they taxied along the taxiway the plane came in that morning. This is taxiway Romeo 6, later becoming Sierra 4 along this stretch. Incidentally, another plane on the west apron that morning was also given taxi clearance to follow the citation. Despite the mistake of the citation pilots, they would continue taxiing along this section of the airport. The controller that was handling it asked for the plane's position, to which they responded they were near the runway. The controller asked them to hold position for a time, thinking they were on the north side of the airport, when in fact they were roughly here. Once dealing with another aircraft, the Cessna Citation was allowed to continue its taxi. The Cessna pilots were themselves unaware of their actual position and so stopped at an identifying marker indicating the Sierra 4 taxiway. This was reported to the tower correctly, but the controller apparently ignored this information because they were unaware that it even existed as it wasn't labeled on the maps. The Cessna Citation continued its taxi where it would inevitably enter the runway. At 8.09, the Scandinavian Airlines plane was holding position on the far side of the runway. A takeoff clearance was received and the MD-87 entered the runway and began the takeoff roll. A brief conversation seconds later between a controller and another plane suggests that the runway visibility was at this time around 200 meters. The view of the runway and airport from the Scandinavian pilots was not much better than the tower. All they would have been able to see out of their window was fog and the runway lights 
fading into the distance into it. The seconds ticked by into 8.10 am. Flight 686 was approaching their rotation speed. Thinking they had been cleared, the Cessna began to cross the runaway as the McDonnell Douglas plane was fast approaching them. Flight 686 did, for a very brief period, lift off the ground before the crash. An ACOS message sent out from the plane back to Scandinavian Airlines operations in Copenhagen suggests that the plane was in the air for roughly 3 seconds before disaster. At precisely 8, 10 and 21 seconds in the morning, the two planes collided. The collision occurred at this runaway and taxiway intersection. The Citation jet was destroyed immediately, breaking into three distinct sections. It is unclear whether the pilots of the Scandinavian Airlines plane actually understood what had happened to their aircraft in this moment, though it is certainly possible not that they would have had much time to react. Following the collision, the MD-87 remained airborne, albeit in a severely wounded state. The right engine and right underside landing gear separated from the fuselage. From collision, the balance of the whole plane shifted, and the pilots would inevitably struggle to regain control of their plane. Barely above the ground, Flight 686 slid over the end of the runway, skewing to the right before impacting the airport baggage handling building beyond the end of the runaway. The plane was calculated to have been travelling at a speed of around 160 miles per hour when the plane crashed into the building. The 110 people on board the plane were killed from the impact. The injuries observed of the passengers varied depending on where they were sat. Those in the back of the plane were subject to severe burns to the point that many were unidentifiable. Those sat in the front of the plane were subject to blunt trauma. The controllers in the tower did not see the collision, the crash of the Scandinavian plane, or the burning building which it crashed into. Minutes would go by as multiple telephone calls went out from around the airport. It wasn't until two minutes later that it was first noticed that Flight 686 was not responding to ATC calls and did not check in themselves with controllers. Flight crews and ground staff on the North Apron also made calls to the tower reporting explosions on the ground. The alarm was sounded and the airport closed until further notice. The wreckage of the Cessna Citation was still sitting there on the runaway. A further four people were killed on the ground, bringing the death toll to 118. The Lenate Airport disaster became the worst aviation accident to ever occur in Italy. Because the accident occurred in the shadow of 9-11, the investigation quickly ruled out terrorism. The Italian National Agency for the Safety of Flight published their final report, which criticized the airport's lack of ground radar technology. Such radar was actually taken out of service in 1999, but was never replaced by the time of the accident. This was rectified three months later. What the investigation did not do was go as far to blame any of the pilots involved in the crash, but it was noted that neither of the two Cessna pilots were qualified to make takeoffs and landings in visibility under 500 meters. The condition of the airport itself was also criticized. Runway and taxiway markings were in a dilapidated state. Runway incursion alarms that were put in place to warn and prevent this exact thing from happening had also been purposely deactivated to prevent false alarms from airport vehicles and animals. In the aftermath, multiple arrests were made, including the airport director and air traffic controllers involved, some even sentenced to prison. Lenate Airport is still in operation today and has since been revamped. Taxiways there have been given new markings and have since been relabeled. A runaway collision of this magnitude has never happened since the Milan Lenate disaster. Hello everyone, thanks so much for watching this week's video. When this video goes out, I will be working trying to bring you an extra video coming soon. I'm not sure when that will be exactly, but I don't really want to spoil anything. With that said, I do hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe as there is always a new video every Saturday. 
A big thanks once again to my patrons for their amazing support. Their names are currently scrolling on the screen right now. If you want to join them and have your name on the end of next week's video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month. You can also join from just £1 per month and get early access to all new content two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube, and also helps to support the channel further. With that said, we do have a new £5 tier patron to shout out this week. A big thank you to Ezra Gonzalez for the support. Thank you so much. Anyway, if you yourself are interested in joining the Patreon, the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. Anyway, I'm going to sign off this video now. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and I will see you next week. Goodbye.